It's such a pleasure to be here uh, and to see so many of you uh, working hard as you always do on a Saturday afternoon. That's, uh, that's impressive in and of itself. Uh, and the Asia Society and the work that you're doing in the schools that are associated with this work uh, is really the future of education. And in many ways, it's the future of our society and the future of our world. So it's, it's an exciting moment. There are many things to worry about. I am here from California where we are going as a state to hell in a handbasket. Um, so th there, there's a lot of hand-wringing going on across the country and especially back home. But there's also, you know, in the seeds of the chaos that we currently have, the possibility of the phoenix arising from the ashes, the possibility of thinking differently, uh, of, of really recalibrating the way we see uh, our education system, the way we see our world. Uh, and I see in the work that you're doing the leadership and the guidance uh, for where we need to be looking. So I'm thrilled to be here. And as Tony mentioned, I am going to talk a little <clears throat> about putting the world into world-class education. What is it that we can learn from nations around the globe? Um, and as all of you know, expectations for learning are changing and many of us have seen uh, dozens of reports which outline what are the skills and abilities that people need in the global society, etc. I point out that this particular slide, if you can read at the bottom, if you have very, very good vision, it's uh, from Chris Wardlaw, who was the deputy minister in Hong Kong. Uh, as part of a, uh, a, a slideshow he was doing on mathematics in Hong Kong, China, improving on being first in PISA. And what that expresses is the drive that people all over the world, uh, including in very high achieving places, uh, have to reform education, uh, to push it even further, because of course we are more dependent uh, on education for our economies, for the way our societies operate than ever before in the history of the world. Uh, and so in, in the context of major reforms in Hong Kong that were being undertaken here to transform the assessment system and the curriculum system, uh, Chris pointed out as a, a list that you will recognize that we need to um, focus uh, attention on the ability to communicate, to change, work in teams and solve problems, analyze and conceptualize, uh, to reflect on and improve one's own performance because the days of the factory model organization of work where somebody else tells you what to do and tells you how well you did it um, are also fast waning. You have to be able to figure out what to do and then figure out whether you're doing it well uh, and improve on it for yourself. That's a whole different uh, set of skills to manage oneself in doing that, to create, innovate, uh, to criticize, to be able to uh, evaluate, to engage in learning new things at all times, uh, and to cross specialist, and I would add to cross uh, national, regional boundaries um, and borders in constructing knowledge. Um, and now this is not to say, uh, some people here have talked about these as 21st century skills. Um, Diane Ravitch just did a wonderful column recently pointing out that many of them are 19th century skills. That is, you know, indeed these have been, uh, you know, these are, these are uh, descriptions of well-educated, thoughtful people that are not bounded in time, but more and more people need to have these abilities in order to succeed and survive today than ever before. They have to be grounded in uh, thoughtful conceptions of the disciplines, of disciplinary knowledge. It's not as though knowledge gets thrown out the window uh, when we focus on these skills. At the same time, we do have to rethink uh, what we consider the most central core knowledge, and we have to be disciplined in our understandings about that. Um, I don't typically quote people from Cal Berkeley across the bay from Stanford, but, but there is a very interesting study I have to tell you about that some professors at Berkeley have been working on for a while. They've been um, looking at the growth of knowledge in the world, and they actually calculate each year sort of how much knowledge has grown and how fast it's changing. And they, uh, published a study which found that between 1999 and 2003, a four-year period, there was more new knowledge created in the world than in the entire history of the world preceding. So if you think about the implication of that, 
Uh, it's not as though we can do what John Dewey criticized reformers for doing 100 years ago, which is figuring out what were all the important facts to learn, dividing them up into the 12 years of the curriculum, uh, slicing it up and saying, you know, learn this in each grade level, and then when you come out of school, you're baked and done. You know, you've learned all there is to know, and you can go off into the world. We actually have to think about what kinds of knowledge are generative, what will allow you to learn, what kinds of facts and understandings are the ones that are sort of the maypoles around which other concepts and understandings are organized, and then how do we help people uh, learn to keep up with this rapidly expanding knowledge. So it's a very different way to think about curriculum uh, than what we have inherited over most of the last century, and countries all over the world are worrying about this. In addition to all of that, I think we also have to worry about developing a moral and ethical core for human beings in this world. Uh, and Martin Luther King made this wonderful uh, observation many years ago uh, that the hope of a secure and livable world lies with disciplined nonconformists who are dedicated to justice, peace, and brotherhood. And I think in this room there are a lot of disciplined nonconformists. Uh, who have that mission. And part of our job is how do we grow up a generation of young people who have those commitments, uh, as well as the cognitive skills that will allow them to survive in this very, very fast-paced and fast-changing world. Now, that's going to require that we change teaching. And some of you know uh, who this is. <clears throat> this is a reminder of teaching past. Uh, a ghost of teaching past. Uh, Ferris Bueller's high school history teacher who, who reminds us what it is that we are moving beyond uh, from the, t the conception of 20th century teaching uh, that predominated in the last hundred years. In 1930, the Republican-controlled House of Representatives, in an effort to alleviate the effects of the, anyone, anyone, the Great Depression, passed the, anyone, anyone, the tariff bill, the Hawley-Smoot Tariff Act, which anyone raised or lowered, raised tariffs in an effort to collect more revenue for the federal government. Did it work? Anyone? Anyone know the effects? It did not work, and the United States sank deeper into the Great Depression. And so did the kids. So, so you'll recognize the features of this kind of teaching. Uh, this is a conception of teaching that you need to know a lot of stuff and you need to be able to say it uh, out loud so the kids will learn it, right? And that's sort of been a way that we've thought about uh, teaching. But fortunately, uh, nations around the world are moving beyond this conception uh, and beginning to think about ways to, I don't know why it's uh, telling me to... Uh, I think I should disable whatever it is that's trying to come up here. Um, that that uh, people around the world are trying to help teachers learn to teach in ways that we know the kids actually learn. Uh, through active engagement, through uh, organizing uh, knowledge in ways that... Uh, we have focused so much in this country on multiple choice tests that come into schools in brown paper wrappers, uh, go out, are scored by machine, and send back two-digit numbers three or four months later when it's too late to use the data for anything uh, for students. And yet, in high-achieving countries, most assessment is essay examinations, uh, oral examinations, and performance tasks that students conduct in the classroom that count toward the uh, scoring of the examinations at the end of the day. Kids are engaged in the kinds of work that actually require them to criticize, analyze, reflect, observe, all of those traits that we talked about before. And so we can learn from places that are organizing education in ways that are high performing. Let me see if I can just keep this moving along. There we go. Uh, let me say a word about some things that we've learned about developing teachers. Uh, one of the key issues, in addition to developing teachers who can teach their content well, is preparing teachers who can teach that content to all students well. Uh, 
Well, let's look at what happened in Finland, if you want to study a place where teachers are prepared in that way. One of the major things that propelled Finland to the top of the international rankings, according to every analyst and government official in Finland, was the overhaul of their teacher education programs. They overhauled every program about 20 years ago. All of them sort of had to restart and reboot uh, from scratch. It's a two or three year graduate level program uh, after people have secured their content um, background at the bachelor's level. Um, and much of that is focused on how do you teach students who are special education students and others who struggle in their learning. And how do you organize your work around assessment, formative assessment and performance assessment of learners. Their reasoning was that if you could teach the kids who struggle to learn well, you could teach anyone well. And that bet really paid off uh, because uh, Finland went to the very top of the rankings. Uh, and their teachers are extremely sophisticated and knowledgeable about how they teach. Uh, all assessment in Finland is uh, a, a local assessment, performance-based assessment in which tasks that students are engaged in ask them to um, design and conduct various kinds of investigations, journalism projects, and so on, uh, and uh, be evaluated on that. It's a very rigorous, intensive process of evaluation, but it is managed, developed, and controlled by teachers. At the high school level, uh, high school faculty and college faculty come together uh, in Finland, Sweden, and a number of other countries and create matriculation exams, which are uh, open-ended items asking uh, thoughtful questions about the kinds of um, uh, core topics that exist in the discipline areas, and they also complement that with these uh, scientific investigations and uh, research projects that are going on in the classroom. Uh, there are uh, many countries around the world that are working on how do we learn from the study of teaching and learning. Everybody knows that no teacher can be prepared and then finished. Uh, and done for life in their learning, you actually learn from your students and how they learn. You learn about teaching by teaching and by reflecting on your teaching. But how do you prepare teachers to do that well? So that, that every year of experience, in fact, uh, expands their expertise rather than having the same year of experience over and over and over again. Uh, well, one good place to look for clues about that is the practice of Japanese lesson study which is now being used in many parts of Asia, where teachers will come together and decide they're going to work on a concept together for a lesson. They design the lesson together. Uh, and then, uh, it, let's say we were doing that together. I might teach it in my classroom. And you would come and observe. And you would have video cameras and audio uh, um, recorders uh, and notes, and you would record what kids were doing and saying. You would record what I'm doing. You would look at the work that resulted from it. Uh, you might even talk to the students about their understanding. Then we would come back together. We would debrief that lesson. What was learned? What worked? What didn't work? And together, we would revise that lesson, and others of you might teach it. Uh, and it would be uh, an evolving piece of um, well-developed pedagogy that we share as a teaching community by reflecting on pedagogical practice, on student learning over and over and over again, all of our understandings of teaching become more fine-tuned. Uh, another strategy uh, that is very widespread, uh, Singapore right now is training virtually all teachers to engage in action research in the classroom where departments will come together and take a teaching problem. When I was in Singapore, an English department that I visited had a theory that if they taught kids uh, by engaging them in debate about certain um, topics before they asked them to write persuasive essays, that the quality of their essays might be better. So they collected data before, from their previous way of, of teaching that unit. They then engaged students in that new topic. Uh, you know, in, in, with the debates embedded in the unit, and then they collected the essays and rescored them collectively at the end uh, and discovered that, in fact, their hypothesis was correct, that kids did write better persuasive essays. They wrote that up for a teaching journal, uh, as did many, many teams of teachers write up their action research projects across the country, and now they can share these learnings in practice uh, across the profession and engage in an ongoing inquiry into what works and what doesn't work uh, in the classroom. 
we can learn about developing standards for students. Uh, in New Zealand and Australia, uh, very, very thoughtful learning progressions for students have been outlined in reading and writing and mathematics that show how people learn over time uh, in each of many, many strands of learning. So how does number sense get acquired? Uh, how does algebraic thinking get acquired over the period of time from the entry of school all the way up through the exit from school? And then how can teachers evaluate that progress and support that progress knowing uh, where to put students on a developmental progression? Uh, we can learn a lot as we go to forward towards common uh, standards in this country about how to organize a learning process that will allow kids to actually meet the standards if we look at what some of our colleague nations uh, have done. Uh, we can think about focusing on generative learning uh, that really enables people to learn to learn. Uh, in, um, in Singapore, uh, the uh, uh, motto over the last 10 years has been thinking schools learning nation. Uh, and that has been a reform organized around infusing more discovery learning, experiential learning, uh, and inquiry orientation into the curriculum. Uh, the more recent reform has been characterized by the words, teach less, learn more. Well, what do they mean by that? Uh, they mean open up the curriculum so there's more opportunity for students to inquire and innovate and pursue their thoughts rather than just uh, uh, blisteringly fast, uh, you're going through the curriculum in a blisteringly fast manner. Uh, and the kinds of tasks that are being developed uh, as part of the high school examinations there, um, including uh, scientific investigations at virtually every grade level that are focused on how do you learn to inquire into a topic, uh, are now part of what shapes the framework in every classroom. So while kids are inquiring and teachers are also inquiring with action research, this notion of learning from what we do becomes embedded in the way everybody thinks about the learning process. And finally, we can learn about developing curriculum assessments that create opportunities for inquiry and reflection and invention. And I want to go back to this little list that we looked at a moment ago of uh, expectations for learning. You'll recall that um, came from the Hong Kong experiment, and then look at an item from a typical U.S. examination. This is from the National Assessment of Educational Progress, 8th and 12th grade science. It looks probably pretty familiar to most of you. You've seen a lot of items like this in your life, maybe even recently. Um, this one simply asks what two gases make up most of the Earth's atmosphere. Either you remember, I could do a poll. Usually when I ask people who thinks it's A, B, C, or D, they were almost evenly um, uh, divided across the four answers. <laughs> so so what, it, what that normally tells me is that whatever uh, process of memorizing that fact people went through in eighth grade or ninth grade, uh, it, it didn't stick with uh, a predominant, with a majority of people. Um, here's an open-ended item on NAEP. Uh, is a hamburger an, ex an example of stored energy? explain why or why not. Now this goes, uh, is called an open-ended item, but it's a yes or no question uh, with a one-sentence response. The answer is yes, it is an example of stored energy and we can take it from there. Here's an item from um, Queensland, Australia, where they began to develop a set of what they call rich tasks. Rich tasks are interdisciplinary tasks that require students to apply what they learn uh, in ways that it would be used in the real world. And I won't ask you to read all that, it's impossible to read, but this is a task where students have to make judgments on a biotechnological process to which there are ethical dimensions. They have to identify and use some of the scientific techniques that are used for research in that field. They have to take up an ethical question and explore the pros and cons of that question. Uh, they have to write um, about both their lab experiments and the ethical issues, and then they select six real-life people uh, who have made relevant contributions to this area and invite them to a conference, write a precy about them and organize a conference to debate the issues. So here's an assessment that measures research and analytic skills, lab practices, a specific scientific um, content uh, in the fields that they're looking at, communication, uh, ethical issues and principles, and also does the thing that 
we really need for kids to be able to understand is how do you organize, frame a problem, manage your time, uh, work with a group, and get things done. Because in the real world, that's what we do. Uh, the multiple choice questions don't reflect the activities we do in the real world. It's not a multiple choice world. I don't know how many of you have ever gone to work in the morning and found a set of questions on your desk with some pre-selected answers that you could um, circle with a number two pencil, and then you could go home for the day because your work was done. And if you found that job, I want it because I love, I love those kind of tests. But they actually don't reflect what people have to learn how to do. So we can learn from what people are doing in assessment around performance tasks that may ask kids to actually demonstrate specific things that they are doing, uh, score work samples, uh, develop portfolios of work. Um, in Finland, you'll find that almost all of the tasks are these open-ended tasks requiring reasoning and production, the same thing in Sweden. Here's an example from a, a Swedish assessment item. Um, in Sweden, they do two uh, external assessments, one at year five, sort of about grade five for us, and one at uh, year 11. Uh, beyond that, it's a, a local assessment process. But they're very interested in kids doing real-world problem solving, where they have to weigh, balance, and evaluate. So that's a very big um, concern in their standards. So here's a, a, an example of how they might test that. Carl bikes home from school at 4 o'clock takes about a quarter of an hour. In the evening, he's going back to school because there's a party, which starts at 6. Before it starts, he has to eat dinner. When he comes home, his grandmother calls, who is also his neighbor. She wants him to bring in her uh, post, her mail, before he bikes over to the classroom. She also wants him to take her dog for a walk and come in and have a chat with her. Um, and so the question for Carl is, what will he have time to do before the party begins and to describe his reasoning? So he not only has to do the mathematics, the, the arithmetic process of estimating time and adding and subtracting and all of that, but he has to say how much is grandma's chatting time worth versus getting to the party, and what's his reasoning process for getting there. So he has to think through, uh, how will I solve this kind of real world dilemma? And you'll see a lot of those kinds of items. Uh, I'm going to uh, give you one last example, which is from the high school biology exam in Victoria, Australia, uh, just to contrast with the item I showed you earlier. In this particular uh, exam, uh, a virus is, there's a, the thing that's blocked out is a picture of the virus, and a particular virus is explained to the students, and they are then asked to design a drug that will be effective against the virus. Uh, and they have a couple of pages in which to uh, give this explanation uh, and offer diagrams about how they will stop the cycle of reproduction of this virus. And then they're asked to design an experiment to test the effectiveness of their drug. So I often ask people, how many kids in the United States do you think would be able to answer this question? Percentage. Ten? I heard a ten. Anybody go for twenty? Five? <laughs> yeah? Five? Okay. Five to ten. Uh, and that's not because students couldn't learn to answer this. It's because we don't regularly ask them to learn to think in this way. How do they get students able to understand this kind of item? In the syllabus for this course, there are also a set of assessments that teachers will assign and grade that will count 50% towards the exam score um, that include practical tasks, which are lab experiments that are outlined, uh, certain uh, activities that uh, allow students to explore and investigate certain phenomena, and a research report on the characteristics of pathogenic organisms uh, and mechanisms by which organisms can defend against disease. That research report is what prepares kids to answer that question later on. Uh, so this notion that we ought to have assessments which embed in the work of the classroom uh, some uh, uh, critically important core concepts and modes of inquiry, uh, and then assess them in different ways, is what drives the learning process. Testing is not just about sending in a sample and pulling it out. It's what drives the learning process. Uh, and, and this is how you get students understanding in a deeper way. The Asia Society is taking on something very similar. Um, in a, a graduation portfolio system, which you uh, know about, I love the uh, GPS acronym, it guides you on your course with 
tasks that will evaluate uh, scientific investigation and problem solving in mathematics and literary analysis, historical understanding, world language proficiency, um, and artistic performance. Uh, we ought to be thinking as well, by the way, of looking at other countries that routinely educate people to be bilingual, trilingual, uh, and sometimes quadrilingual uh, around the development of those proficiencies. And in every case, these tasks incorporate global understandings and perspectives of how you investigate the world and recognize perspectives, uh, collaborate, and take action. Uh, these kinds of assessments are going to create a very different teaching and learning experience uh, for students in these schools. And we need to be working at the state and national levels to create a context within which that kind of assessment is the routine and the norm uh, for students all across the country. So what do we learn from these kinds of high quality assessment systems? One critical thing is that if you have tasks that kids are asked to do that are requiring application of knowledge is that that's going to improve our learning expectations for all students. Uh, having expectations and not having occasions in which you enact those uh, is a, a huge slip between the cup and the lip. Uh, curriculum embedded tasks like the ones we saw that students have to engage in on their way through the semester uh, actually create curriculum equity. One of the problems we have with testing in our country is that tests come in and out and scores are produced, but the curriculum that students experience is radically different. In some classrooms, students will be engaging in scientific investigation on a regular basis. In other classrooms, they will be copying material from the textbook uh, or bubbling in day after day test prep materials uh, to get them ready for the test, but not for the real world and not for life beyond. Uh, that moment. Uh, and so until we begin to embed these kinds of assessments in the curriculum, we will not get the kind of curriculum equity that exposes kids to the kind of thinking that they need to do. Teacher engagement in developing and scoring and monitoring these tasks supports teacher learning. Teachers get smarter about assessment. Connecting these tasks to the standards makes us clearer about the, the curriculum and sharing practice across sites, which we'll be able to do in the Asia Society schools that participate in the portfolio, electronically looking at examples of student work, looking at examples of one another's projects, will make a huge difference in supporting system learning. Finally, we can learn from others around how to create more equal schools. OECD has just put out 10 uh, benchmarks to uh, equity. Uh, which have to do with more equitable access to curriculum by limiting tracking. One of the very important things that Finland and Sweden did uh, in the 1980s was get rid of their tracking systems uh, that had dominated their um, school environment prior to that time uh, to actually manage choice so that it's equitable. Uh, Singapore has a whole range of schools that are sort of like charters and uh, some private schools, but guess what? Any kid who wants to go to any school uh, not only has access, but is, uh, has full payment to be able to go to those schools. The schools are managed so that they're equitable in what they provide. Uh, we can be much more focused on the practices that will help students uh, who are falling behind and provide equitable resources if we look at and learn from other countries. So what can we do with what we learn? I think in this country, uh, our agenda is, uh, needs to become much more focused. Uh, on what kind of education we need over the coming years. Uh, we have an education-oriented president. Uh, we have a uh, keen sense of need. I think we need to get a very, very clear agenda for what has to happen. One is that we cannot afford to maintain the level of inequality in this country that we have become accustomed to over the last 200 years. It simply is antiquated. Uh, we have to close the opportunity gap. We have to work to ensure that there's equitable resources for all schools. That means if you're in a wealthy community or in a school that's doing well, you have to be just as concerned about the resources going to the communities next door. Uh, it means that when everyone is talking at the state level and to their federal representatives, that they focus on the need for preschool and health care and equitable resources for all kids. It's going to mean the federal government needs to ask states to demonstrate they're making progress towards equity as well as progress towards academic proficiency. 
Because right now we don't have two-way accountability. We have accountability for students and teachers to produce test scores, but no one's held accountable for ensuring that the resources are in place to allow kids to meet those standards. Uh, we can learn how to create a strong profession of teaching. We can do what other high-achieving nations have done and say everybody who comes into the teaching profession will be fully supported to come in without graduating with a pile of debt to go into a profession where they're going to give their life's blood every day. Uh, they can, we can ensure that they get high quality preparation. Uh, so this uh, crew of folks from the Trinity University uh, International Schools where um, uh, the quality of the preparation for all teachers is, is uh, what everybody in this country ought to receive. We're so good at innovation. We're so bad at building systems in this country. We innovate and we create a good program here and a good project there and a nice school over here, but then we have to learn to scale it up so that's available to all teachers, um, so that there's meaningful evaluation and feedback and recognition. We should be insisting that every school design itself and that governments support schools to offer at least 10 hours a week for teachers to be involved in shared learning, collaboration, observation of other classrooms, lesson study, to develop the kind of practice that is routinely developed in high achieving countries around the world. And we should insist that we focus our schools on meaningful learning with the kinds of expectations in our curriculum and assessment systems that really get kids where they're gonna need to go in a global society. So let me close with just a global perspective on this educational mission. Uh, Martin Luther King uh, said uh, in, uh, to his own children uh, in 1963, he said, I'm going to work and do everything I can do to see that you get a good education. I don't ever want you to forget that there are millions of God's children who will not and cannot get a good education. And I don't want you feeling that you are better than they are. For you will not be what you ought to be until they are what they ought to be. So I, I want to Thank you for the work that you are doing to be sure that every child is getting an education that allows them to be what they are.